Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hello, happy new year. It's a Wednesday night, and that means it is time for Friends in Fiction. It is the happiest night of the week, and tonight we are so excited to introduce you to Sally Hepworth and Kelly Rimmer. Happy New Year, and welcome to our winter 2022 season. I'm Kristen Harmel. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. I'm Patty Callahan Henry. And I'm Mary Kay Andrews. And this is Friends in Fiction. Four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories to support indie booksellers. Our guests for the evening, like I said, are Sally Hepworth and Kelly Rimmer. We cannot wait for you to meet them. And right now, I'm sure they're going to be backstage complimenting us at any moment. Just they're waiting for talking us. talking about us right now. I'm, oh waiting for them, I'm, I'm waiting for them to weigh in in the chat, but enough of mm -hmm. that. Okay. <laughs> As you know, we continue to er encourage you to support indie bookstores when and where you can. And one way to do that is to visit our own Friends in Fiction bookshop.org page, where you can find Sally and Kelly's books, and of course, Diane Chamberlain's, and books by the four of us and our past guests at a discount. Of course, at bookshop.org, a portion of each sale through the Friends in Fiction bookshop goes to support independent bookstores, and it also helps us show. I mean, we've got to keep the lights on somehow. So <laughs> if you enjoy watching, this is a great way to support our guests, indie bookstores, and the Friends in Fiction group itself all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And speaking of supporting indie bookstores, don't forget that our spring box is now available for order from our friends at Oxford Exchange. If you don't live near a bookstore where Mary Kay and I will be touring, this is your best way to make sure that your books are autographed. Order now and receive my The Wedding Veil in March, Mary Kay's The Home Records in May, and a special Friends in Fiction notebook complete with sticky flags for marking all your favorite pages, which they're gonna we know there'll be like a lot of tons. Those. You're probably yeah. gonna run out of the sticky notes. Probably just yeah. Well, yeah, they want sticky flags. Or the ones with bad words in my book. Do y'all write <laughs> in the margins of books and put no. in the stickies? Do you do that? You know what? I do. I don't, but I would like to start doing that. So that's gonna be my New Year's resolution. You heard it here first. Ah, okay. I, yep. I dog ear my pages and then forget why I've dog eared them. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. I I don't. I'm not past writing in a book. I will definitely <laughs> I would, circle I things think, and. I think that's really neat. And like every romantic movie, like they do that. You know, like they write notes and then they give each other the book. Well, not every, <laughs> but like a lot of them. That's actually. Kind I of can funny. think of like five. Have y'all never seen that? Okay, we'll talk about yeah. that. <laughs> I've actually never seen that in a movie. That's a. I'll send you some clips. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we are also a few days into our very first. Friends and Fiction Reading Challenge. Our friend Anissa Armstrong has been sharing with you on the Facebook page. And here's what we're doing. Each month of this year, there will be a different reading prompt. And we all brainstormed together and we all came up with this list and we're really excited about it. And we encourage you to not only complete all 12 months, but also to keep track of what you've read this year. One way to do that is with our beautiful, incredible Blue Linen Reading Journal mm -hmm. signed by us in conjunction with Oxford Exchange. It has a gorgeous Friends in Fiction cover, quotes from us, all of us, and plenty of space to record your thoughts on what you're reading. This month's prompt is a debut novel, which could be a current debut or a debut novel from one of us or from one of your favorite authors or even a classic. And we hope you'll consider picking up the journal and it's a great way to keep track. And we hope you'll join us in this fun challenge. They'll be talking about it on the page. So keep your eye out. 
Sounds good. All right, ladies, I cannot believe it's already 2022. How did this happen? I feel like the last year just went by in a blur. In a blur. It, a complete blur, right? Especially that last month, December just flew by. But, you know, I cannot think of a better pair of authors to ring in our 2022 mm -hmm. winter season with than Kelly Rimmer and Sally Hepworth. I adore these two women, both as people and as writers. And I cannot wait for all of you out there to meet them and spend a little bit of time with them tonight, too, because I know you're going to love them as much as we do. Um, we have a bit of a first tonight as um, these two lovely writers who also happen to be good friends with each other are both joining us from Australia. So let's hear a little bit about them. Let's do. Sally Hepworth is a New York Times bestselling author of seven novels, including The Good Sister and The Mother-in-Law. Sally writes incisively about family, relationships, and identity, and her domestic thrillers have been translated into more than 20 languages. She lives in Melbourne, Australia with her husband and three children. And here in the States, we actually share the same editor at St. Martin's Press, the amazing Jen Underlin, or Genderlin as some of us call her. So it's kind of like we're publishing sisters. You guys are Aww. best friends already. I love yeah. it. I love it. <laughs> or at least related. Yeah. yeah. Somehow. Yeah. yeah. Kelly Rimmer is the New York Times bestselling author of 11 novels, including The Warsaw Orphan and The Things We Cannot Say. Her books have been top 10 bestsellers in her home country of Australia and have also appeared on bestseller lists, including The Globe and Mail and Toronto Star Lists in Canada, The New York Times, Wall Street Journal and USA Today lists in the U.S. Kelly's books have been translated into dozens of languages and can be found in bookstores all over the world. Kelly lives with her husband, her two children, and a whole menagerie of badly behaved animals in rural Australia. I love that. I love imagining what it looks like where they live. Yeah. Uh -huh. you know? yeah. I've never been to Australia. I don't me know neither. I know. No, me neither. I want yeah. to. Okay, let's go visit them. Do you think they'll mm -hmm. live? Okay. Yes. They would the love it. They would love We're delightful. We're delightful. <laughs> We're delightful. We're to that We're point now. I'm not sure the word delightful has Show ever been used. surprise house guests. I think that would be great. <laughs> All right. Sally's upcoming novel, The Younger Wife, came out in October in Australia and is set to be released on April 5th in the United States. Kelly Rimmer's latest is The Warsaw Orphan, and it came out just this past year. And our own Kristen Harmel raved about it. Loved it. Her next novel, The German Wife, will be out in June. So in other words, we will be hearing a lot from these women in 2022. We cannot wait to dig in with them. Sean, can you bring Sally and Kelly on, please? Hi, ladies. Hi. <laughs> Hello. I have a spare room in Australia, so if any of you want to visit, come and stay with me because then we'll definitely be BFF. Okay, can we all four of us in that spare room? Can we I want all a kangaroo. Yes. Do you have a kangaroo? I'll build a wing. Yep, I'll get I've, I've got kangaroos. I've got kangaroos out in need? the country and I've got a tiny home. So like two of you could probably squeeze in there at once. It'd be great fun. You can that do like a so tour fun. of Australia, you know, cosmopolitan oh, Melbourne where Sally lives. That would <laughs> be like so it. cool. <laughs> All right. So ladies, we are so thrilled to have you. And we're thrilled that our travel plans are already coming together. This plan is coming to fruition. Um, by the end of the show, we're going to have you paying our airfare. So um, <laughs> hang in there. It gets better. Um, so your new American le uh, releases are still a few months away, as we said. And I want to talk about both of those books tonight, too. But before we do, we wanted to ask you both about your latest books that most of our viewers can get their hands on now. So we could ask you ourselves, or we could bring on a friend of ours to do the honors. Sean, is there anybody else waiting hmm. backstage? Somebody else? Hey! Hi. 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 Cute Sally! Okay, Sally's reaction is exactly what I pictured for my book club selection. She, her writing is that, is that in a nutshell. I just love her so much, Sally. Nice to see you. So nice Emily, to see you. <laughs> Emily's obviously going to have to come to Australia with us. I hope you have yes, room for five. Yes. <laughs> either either place is fine. I'm working yeah. on my flight right now as we speak. But, um, Fantastic. Kristen, Kristen, Patty, and Mary Kay, thank you so much for giving me this chance to say hello to them. It was such a, I'm so, so thrilled. 
Well, when we're sorry, I can't talk. Like, yes. <laughs> so, um, congratulations. Yeah, this, um, Sally, your book is getting so buzzed. I picked it for my my very book club, and um, we have shared the same editor for a while too, and as I did with Mary Kay. Um, so just adore you, but tell a little bit about um, the book. Sorry, now I have to pull it together. Um, so the Good Sister <laughs> is uh, I can't remember what it's about. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's about twin sisters. I just can't believe I'm just looking at all of my my literary heroines here. Um, and uh, it's about twin sisters. Um, I'm trying to remember their names. No, Fern and Rose, who are um, uh, a very close. <laughs> it's going to be, if my publicist sees this, like I'm going to get, okay. Fern and Rose, who are twin sisters, they're incredibly close, not just because they're twins, but also because they have uh, shared this really difficult, really tumultuous childhood together. And now they are adults, um, they're living, you know, reasonably functioning lives. And the book kicks off when Fern uh, discovers that her twin sister wants to have a baby and she isn't able to have that baby. And so Fern, who is on the spectrum, but not diagnosed, um, decides she wants to have a baby for her sister. And uh, that journey leads her into this whole new life that she, she really hadn't been living and, and causes her to kind of make some discoveries about her childhood and, and her life that were not, in fact, uh, you know, nothing is as it seems, as it were. How was that? Oh my God, did I pull it together? You, you did. It together. Beautifully done. <laughs> wow, whole <laughs> sentences. That's a um, um, <laughs> <awesome. laughs> complete that sentence. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, I find it so hard to talk about the book right as it's coming out. Like by the end Me of too. your book tour, It'll be, but that was impressive. Yeah. And um, <laughs> yes, um, I, I just can't wait to discuss it. Um, should I give the details now? On the, on the yeah, website? yeah, tell, tell us yeah. a little bit about your book club, Emily, and how okay, we can sure. join. Yeah, it's, um, well, uh, I know two of you know about it well, because my selection <laughs> in November was Patty Callahan's, and I swear I just happened to have this here. Like, I didn't even have <laughs> um, copies in every room, but um, <laughs> absolutely loved, obsessed, and if you missed the book club with Patty that I had in um, in November, you can find it on my um, book club page, which is at EG Book Club. Very original with those initials. Um, but yes, you can go check that out. And then, of course, in December, I did Mary Kay. I don't have a copy of the Santa suit lying right here, Patty Kay. Mary Kay, but I loved it, as you know. Um, so, and I, I just can't wait. I cannot wait to kick off 2022 with more. One of my very favorite crush on Mr. Sally Hepworth. <laughs> so cute. Do you guys follow? Do you, do you follow him? Oh no, my gosh! Yeah, your husband's like an internet celebrity, Sally. Is he? <laughs> Yeah, he's he's um, accidentally famous. I'm I'm amazed. We're we're uh, we're out in the street sometimes, and people come up to him and ask for an autograph, and they don't look at me at all. So, oh my God. it's the way it should be. He's very he's very very charming. I have to say, but you guys have a great shtick going. Um, but I want to uh, just ask Kelly about her book too, and tell us about that, and then I'll um, let you guys take back over here. Sorry, I know I'm taking up too much time, but it's just so fun. No, no, this is no, awesome. you're not at all. I'm just Kelly, thinking about how I'm so distracted being, thinking how glad I am that I didn't know you were coming because I was already so nervous Sorry. and starstruck. And now I'm like, how on earth do I put words like <laughs> this? Doesn't <laughs> uh, uh, my book is about um, it's set in Warsaw during the during World War Two, uh, during the later years of the war. So uh, I've got two protagonists. One is Amelia, who is a young Polish Catholic girl who has already in the first few years of the war pretty much lost her whole family, but she's with an adoptive family and she's somewhat sheltered from what's going on just just a few blocks away in the Warsaw Ghetto. And um, my other protagonist is a young Jewish Catholic boy who is trapped in the ghetto with his family. And so we kind of follow their journeys through the years, the, the end of the war and the early communist years. How'd I do? 
Did I, did I do it? So great. And, and the book is so good. Okay. <laughs> well, you're, Emily, you're thank you. Writer. Thank you guys for letting me say hello. Uh, and I just want to remind everyone it's Monday, Monday, January 24th at 7 p.m. I'll be live with Sally from Australia. Um, yeah, Kelly, you're welcome to pop on over there too and join us. <laughs> oh, um, that would be so cool. I'll watch. I'll and, watch and, you my pajamas and be amazed. <laughs> My friends and friends in fiction, thank you. You guys are the best. I love you. Hey, everybody, everybody, don't, everybody, don't forget Emily's new book, Meant to Be, will yeah. be out, I think, May 28th. Is that right? I'm so Emily? excited. I know that. Every time she posts, too. like, my edits are done, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, hurry up. It's getting so closer. Great. I know. <laughs> well, that was so good to see her. I can't believe you just did that. Like I just, I'm, I'm actually shaking. That was just, wow. <laughs> well, Patty, do you want to dive in with some yes. questions okay. for Sally and That Kelly? was really cool to have her stop by. And it's so, you know, I'm looking around the screen and I'm like zinging around. Just, uh, so many inspiring women in one place. It's so cool. Mm. So it just proves what we already know that friendship is so important to all of us. It's at the very core of what we do here on Friends in Fiction. And we're all, I've known Emily for 20 odd years and the friendship we have with each other and with our community has really, really, we cannot say this enough, sustained us over these last two years. And I know Kelly and Sally that the two of you are friends and your support for each other is such a beautiful and hilarious thing to watch. <laughs> and Kelly, you blurbed Sally's last book, The Mother-in-Law, saying it's twisty and suspenseful, but even more than that, it's clever and nuanced. Mm. Oh, that's a really good blurb. I can't remember writing that. It's yeah. great, though. It really captures it. Well done, me. <laughs> I wonder if I could borrow it. Okay, and then <laughs> Sally, you actually have one of your characters reading and discussing Kelly's The Things We Cannot Say in oh, your wow. book, The Good Sister, which I think is such a great goal that we all yeah, should somehow that. mention each other in our book. All three of you are in my 2023 book. <gasps> Yay! Oh my gosh, okay. It's so fun. New goals. New goals. And um, your blurb for that book is... So hilarious. You said, if this book isn't a giant bestseller, I will eat my hat. Well, <laughs> it was a giant bestseller. So we're assuming you didn't have to eat that hat. And I should also say that you both live in two completely different areas of Australia, Melbourne and New South Wales, which is actually, aren't you guys at least 10 hours apart? Right? Yeah, okay. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've never actually done the drive and, and whenever I picture Kelly, she's just in the middle of Australia somewhere living with a lot of goats around. But I assume <laughs> that um, so if we did do the drive, then I would get lost and I'd never make it. So I reckon 10 hours before I give up, for sure. Okay, but like the four of us, you're dear friends, despite the miles between you. So I want to hear about how you two met and how you became friends. So Kelly, you oh, want to tell this start one. us off? Or you want to start oh. us off, Kelly? <laughs> um, I'll start yes, it because I did start it. Hmm. So Sally, I think, I think that her earbuds are your dying. Earbuds are dying. Your, yeah. Yeah, your, your, sound, uh, your sound's just gone now. So, yeah, yeah, Sally, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Hang on. I'll tell this story while she does because I tell it better anyway. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> like a true friend. <laughs> this, is, this is the nature of our friendship is that we rib one another mercilessly. But it didn't start out that way because obviously I was aware of Sally and secretly fangirling from up here in New South Wales. Um, and then one day, and so I'd been following her on social media and I knew she was in the US. Um, and one day I got this message from a reader, I think in North Carolina, who said, oh, I was at an event tonight or yesterday, whenever, and Sally Hepworth recommended your book. And I picked it up and read it and loved it. And I was like, how did that happen? <laughs> That's a, like absolutely, you know, because 
don't hopefully she can't you can hear this can't you oh damn it well I was a little bit like starstruck I was obviously I get starstruck quite easily and I was thinking <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> so I waited a few days and calmed down a bit and then I sent Sally an email and thanked her for recommending my book because I didn't you know we didn't know each other we do have like there's mutual friends around the place the Australian literary community is not that large as you might imagine but I didn't know her directly um and Sally being the really enthusiastic person she is wrote back to my email very kindly and basically forced me to be her best friend after that I didn't want to be I was like I've got enough friends I don't need another one but here we are a couple of years later and um and I've grudgingly come to um to accept her in my friendship circle <laughs> did I get it I'm sure it's Sally that was good okay, can you can you hear me now yes you're sounding yeah, great Sally yep 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 Good. Well, she's never actually publicly admitted to being my friend before. Usually I've just been this desperate loser that just refers to her as my BFF in public and she says, eh, not so much. So I think this counts now. And, um, and yes, indeed, it was exactly like that and we were both so enthusiastic and then we really liked each other a lot until we were doing an event together a few months ago and uh, I tried to get Kelly to admit that we were BFFs and she said well unfortunately I don't have an available slot because I've just become BFFs with Kristen Harmel and it's true at that point, I said well fair enough like I would drop you like a hot potato if I was you know had an opportunity to be, a, be BFFs with Kristen Harmel and then lo and behold one of your uh, uh, Anissa I think, Anissa um, Yes. Was was watching our pathetic event, um, and <laughs> and then she went, I guess, and got in touch with you, Kristen, and we were mid event, and and then you popped on in the comments, <laughs> and we lost our minds. I mean, I, I, we couldn't. We, we are just so professional. You might not have and, noticed it, but we really did. <laughs> and, oh, and we, I still don't know how we managed to pull this off because <laughs> since then. You then invited us to come on uh, and do that little thing about friendship and we were freaking out. We were in the DMs going, this is just not going to work, we're going to ruin it, we're going to get cancelled. And then we got invited here and we just we can't quite believe it. We're, we're still, um, as you can that see. My favourite thing that you posted, Sally, was when you posted that y'all were coming on the show and you had like, you and Kristen over here with the two girl emoji <laughs> yeah. and Kelly over there by herself. And well, then Christy, I spent the about an hour <laughs> trying to like edit that graphic so I could fire back a real zinger. But we're traveling at the moment and I didn't post it. I forgot to, like it wasn't perfect and I didn't post it. But that's where we're at. That's how sad yeah. I am, a whole hour. <laughs> it took me ages Hilarious. to do it in the first place. Well, that's how important perfect. friendship is. Like, it's true. Uh, I want to know. This is all the friendship. <laughs> yeah, and I want to know what it's meant to the two of you over the course of your publishing career. Like, how has it affected your books? How has it affected your support? Has it, you know, in publishing, not just making us laugh our actual beep off, but <laughs> like, what has it meant for your publishing world? I want to know. Shall I go? Or? Yeah, you go yeah, and go then I'll, I'll fix whatever you say. <laughs> <laughs> Edit. <laughs> edit it um it's meant everything and and I think um you know I, I always laugh when people talk about publishing being a cutthroat industry yeah. um maybe it is in some world but not in this you know no. world that we live in and and Kelly and I particularly have really followed the same trajectory in terms of our you know the, the books that that the time we started writing the kind of periods in which we found success and I don't know what we would have done without each other, and I'm going to get her to admit that too, because we often find ourselves kind of, if we're not both on it together like now, we would have texted each other to say, we're going on the Friends and Fiction, what do we do to not stuff this up? And then the other one writes back and says, make sure you don't do this because this didn't go well. And, you know, or... or or, you know, whatever it is, it might be an event that we're doing, it might be a knotty kind of plot thing that we're working out, a contract that we're negotiating. We might need someone to interview us for something. Um, and we've just got each other right there that understands the situation, that yeah. wants to help, that wants our yeah. success, and um, that understands a world that 
you know, in the general kind of scheme of things, people don't really understand. And, yeah. uh, you know, I really, as uh, as someone who does publicly gush, I can say that I wouldn't be where I was if it wasn't for Kelly. Now, I want you to agree to that um, on air. I just <laughs> uh, would like ever, <laughs> if did everyone catch that Sally just admitted I am behind all of her success? Because I really, <laughs> I feel like I don't get enough credit for that. <laughs> you are the woman behind the woman. I am. I mean, a lot of people think it's Christian, but I think we know the truth now and we've got it recorded, so this has been very good. Actually, it's thing. Mary Kay, my new BFF. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think the thing is, um, even at this stage of my career, I don't actually know what I'm doing. And yeah. it's not. this is not something that you can really train for. And so no. it's it's been... No, no. It has really been, and I will I will admit it, despite the recording, I I don't know how I would have handled the last few years if I didn't have Sally to bounce things off because oh, you, wow. you, you just, you're just winging it all the time and it's really easy to lose your confidence. But, yeah. you know, even like you sometimes get maybe a message from a reader that's not so warm and it's yeah. really great to have someone to be able to say, oh, look, I just got this or, you, you know, even it's the ups and downs. It's not being on that journey alone. So yeah. I grudgingly will admit I'd be completely lost without her. We don't really do sincerity, though, do we, Sally? So this is a bit uncomfortable. Australians don't like sincerity. No, it makes us very uncomfortable. <laughs> I feel like Americans are better at it. Yes, um, definitely. And so... Yeah, after we after we finish this, we'll get on the private chat and say, Bleh! never say that. Oh, that, was a bit, that was awful. They made us be nice to each other. It's yeah. like horrible. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Uh, you brought out the sincere in the Australian. I love it. Amazing. I love it. <laughs> We're always enacting our will on our guests. You know? yeah. <laughs> Um, well, Sally, speaking of funny people, um, you know, we've all talked about how much we loved the mother-in-law as did Kelly, but so did comedian, writer, and actress, Amy Poehler of Saturday Night Live and Parks and Recreation fame. And so you were talking about, um, in the Guardian about your meeting with her in LA on your way back from New York, where you were talking about the book on Good Morning America. Yeah, um, so yeah. obviously, whirlwind takeover of the world, and in particular, the United States. So can you tell us about that? And really, what was it like meeting Amy Poehler? <laughs> oh, it was so embarrassing. Like, you can imagine what I was like. Like, it was, uh, anyway, I, I just like to sort of roll on the fact that I'm Australian, and maybe they'll blame the Australianness on me being a massive loser, but I think it's actually more <laughs> just me. But um Yes, I was in, uh, I flew to New York for three days. Like, can you even imagine um, no. that now? I mean, we've been locked in Australia for a couple of years, so I can't even imagine, you know, going to Sydney. But it's kind of a 27-hour flight to get to New York from here. And uh, I got there. I did the um, the Good Morning America. And then that night I got an email from my agent saying, uh, would you like to have breakfast with Amy Poehler in LA on the way home? So I checked my diary. <laughs> oh my gosh! I cannot take it. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm I'm quite busy. I'm having breakfast with Sharon Stone. No, I, I lost my mind. And uh, and and at this point, I knew she was interested. We'd had a, a very humiliating phone call back when I had been in Australia, um, but this was kind of the next step. And so I flew back to LA. I uh, we we had breakfast at the Beverly Hills Hotel. I mean, it was so. It was funny, this particular hotel where we had breakfast. The seats were all in horseshoe kind of things really terrible for when you're having a group situation because we sat down and I was in the kind of the bottom of the U and then my agent was on one side and then there were two people from Amy's production company on the other side and then Amy arrived and of course I had to hug it out because it was before COVID and it was Amy and so then I had to kind of say oh hi Amy and then I had to stand up and like shimmy out of the horseshoe <laughs> hug her and then shimmy back in, which, I mean, there's no way to be cool while doing the shimmy into a horseshoe. But, look, in, in general, the it was a great conversation. She was every bit as lovely and, and funny and, you know, and, and beautiful as she is, you know, on TV. 
Um, I felt like I did an, a reasonable job of acting like a professional and, you know, engaging in, you know, normal uh, professional conversa uh, conversation. But as we were leaving um, and the valets were getting the, the cars and all that kind of fabulous stuff, I was walking alongside her and I thought, well, I'm going to have to get a selfie, you know, because imagine going home and not getting a selfie. Like mm -hmm. it just, and there's no way of asking for a selfie without giving up, you know, all of your power, you know. Like right. we've been acting yeah. as if we were peers, which everyone knew we weren't, but <laughs> I had to ask for the selfie. It was a dreadful selfie. I have 50,000 chins. It's now been all over every article that I've ever done. And it was worth every minute because it was just glorious. And and then shortly after that she bought the rights and uh and then you know away we go. So it was awesome. it was wonderful, a career highlight for sure. That's, That's awesome. so great. That's what a great story. story. And now I'm insanely, insanely jealous. Okay, Kelly. <laughs> now that I have written Sally off because I'm have professional jealousy, which we're not. <laughs> <laughs> Sally, you're dead to me. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, I like you. I like you. <laughs> You're such a master of historical fiction. The Things We Cannot Say was a huge worldwide bestseller. And the Warsaw Orphan was a huge hit this year, too. And I have to tell you, I loaned it to my daughter in love and she was raving about it. So that's why I haven't oh, read it you. yet. But thank you. Well, she got it for free. So you might not want to thank me. <laughs> <laughs> but first, I want to know what draws you to writing about history. I didn't mean to do this. I, I was writing. I, I don't. I still don't think of myself as like a historic fiction writer. I just like writing about people in interesting situations. And over yeah. time, I, I have an interest in history. And so, you know, I, I read a little thing and then you know how it goes. You just get the seed of an idea mm -hmm. and then away we go. And it's been, I think, over the last few years with the world in such a, a chaotic kind of era, I, I'm drawn to previous chaotic eras. And mm -hmm. so out these historical fiction novels just keep popping out of me. Um, but I never, I've never set out to do this. I've really, my earlier novels were mostly contemporary and and here we are. I <laughs> just am kind of fascinated by this, by this, you know, by this era now. So I don't know. Did they really well. just pop out? That makes that sound so delightful. Oh, it's I wish my novels Sally. popped out. It really out. is. I just, I just sit at the computer and then they just write themselves. I mean, that is how talented I am. Does that not happen for you? Okay, sorry, my, 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 my books are just like my babies. This is a very long, painful, laborious, you know, extraction the, process. The irony is that you of what people know they don't pop out because I'm texting you going, why, why, not? why can't I finish this book? What do I do next? And ah, I'm, I'm back for another round of edits. It's so terrible. So you know that's not true. But at least they pop out looking gorgeous, whereas mine come out with those funny misshapen heads, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's mine too. And okay, blotches. Kelly. And blotches on their yeah. feet. You know, <laughs> screaming yeah. their heads up. Yeah. <laughs> Kelly, I've also read a great quote from you where you said, if you're going to write fiction against, set against real life historical events, you owe it to the people who, who live through those times to do so respectfully and to try to get the details mm -hmm. right. Research matters. Would you talk about that and, and your research methods since you're stuck in New South Wales now for I don't even know how long. <laughs> yeah, um, I had grand plans for this book that I'm just the German wife. I was going to go to Germany and then to Alabama and to Texas. And obviously Germany and happen. Alabama and Texas. That's an interesting book tour. <laughs> I you know, know it would have been amazing. Can you imagine how much fun I would have had? I would have been full of schnitzels in Germany and then full of cornbread. And it would have been the best, best trip ever. Um, <laughs> okay, I, Kelly, I live <laughs> one hour from Huntsville. We would no, have. Oh, we could, that would have been, see, this would have been amazing. Alas, I pandemic. I live in here Birmingham. We are. So. Oh. Look, when I get there, because this is my second book set in Alabama and I've never been there. So when oh, I get there, I will come and visit you or we can meet in a coffee shop because I'm imagining you wouldn't want to tell me where you live. No, no, no. <laughs> you can come. All my children have fled. Don't so tell her. Oh, There's all right. Well, this is a date then. <laughs> um, I take the research prop. I over-research. I think most, most writers 
who are writing about issues or history over research because you need to understand context and not just individual details. And so I and I am a person who likes very much going down rabbit holes when I'm researching. So I waste a lot of time, but I think it's really important to understand because you are when you're touching on things that really happened, especially things like World War Two or you know issues that really affect people's lives. You can if you don't get the detail right, you can paint a picture that makes people underestimate things that should never be underestimated. And so, so for me, that it's and it's something that it happens all the time. It's quite damaging where you, you, you. I make mistakes in every single book. Um, we all do, but it's you just have to do your absolute best out of everything. You just have this has to be something that you prioritize and value. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, how do you get it right? Um, a lot of reading, and I love photographs and oral history. So yes, I yeah. I mean, for me, you, from a photograph, you can learn so much about, you know, the, the style of dress, what's in the background, what are people's expressions telling you? We're actually mm -hmm. really fortunate when it comes to writing about World War II that there are, you know, great big repositories that you can access even from rural New South Wales uh, online and you can send away for things and there's great books. And by looking at those primary sources, you can, you don't get someone else's interpretation you, you actually, it's as close as you're going to get to sitting down and talking to someone and hearing about their experience. So, yeah. so for me, they're my two favourites is oral history and photograph. And so when I'm in the midst of that first draft, my, my office, which is my little tiny home in the bush, um, I plaster the walls with photographs. And, you know, when I'm stuck, you know, when you, you're trying to write a scene and you're just kind of not sure what's coming next and I pace mm -hmm. and I look at the photographs and, I, you know, you're trying to honour those people uh, even if you're not writing their specific story, you want to honour their experience and their, and their suffering and their hope and all of those things. So I, you know, try and look at those people and think, <laughs> what comes next? Yeah. You know, what comes next? Yeah, that's absolutely great. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you both have novels coming out in the U.S. this year. Sally, um, the younger wife, is out now in Australia and will be out in April in the U.S. And Kelly, your new book, The German Wife, is coming in June. So first, obviously, you titled your books because my 2019 book was called The Winemaker's Wife, and this was all just a ploy yep. so that we'd have something in common. I recognize that. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you about that in a minute. Oh, my goodness now. She says, wow. Wasn't it? I know. So I know. desperate and needy. We're not subtle. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd love to ask you. Before I get into the weird, desperate psychology of what makes a person do something so strange, um, <laughs> <laughs> Sally, can yeah. you tell us a little bit about The Younger Wife? Yeah, I'm trying to remember what that one's about now. No, yeah, so so The Younger Wife is about, apart from being a desperate attempt to, to make friends, it's also about <laughs> a uh, family, a, a family. Sally, you got to take, take the earbuds out. Oh, sit. Sit. <laughs> Nope. No, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. you um, you know what, now? Sally? Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, you're perfect. back. Good. Yeah. Okay, forget them. Not using them anymore. Uh, so <laughs> the younger wife is like all of my books about family dysfunctionality, and uh, which is my favourite thing to write about. And in this Good book. Enough. Because there's so much fodder, right? Especially at this time of year when people have had Christmas oh, yeah. and, you know, everyone's pretending they love each other, but really, you know, there's yeah. stuff going on that's beyond, you know, below apart. the surface. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's falling apart over the turkey. But uh, the, the younger wife is about the Aston family. They are an adult family, a mother, a father, and two adult daughters. And uh, the, the patriarch of the family, as it were, uh, kicks off the story when he decides to marry a woman younger than his adult daughters. And he does this while his wife and the mother of those daughters is still alive but in a nursing home with dementia. And uh, this book then kind of, it, it starts with a wedding where someone gets murdered um, and then we kind of go backwards in time to see what uh, led up to the murder, who was murdered, and who did it? And uh, it, it's told yeah. through the perspective of the two daughters and the uh, soon-to-be younger wife. And there's lots of twists and turns, and uh, and yes, and dysfunctionality that some of us might recognise from our own families. That's awesome. So good. I um, 
I read that book in a day and was up until like two in the morning finishing it. <clears throat> I loved it so much. It was so amazing. Oh, I can't wait for people to get to read it. Kelly, can you tell us a little bit about The German Wife, which I have not read yet, which I'm so mad at you about, but no, <laughs> finish it. Hurry up and finish it's it. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> well, in 2019, I live near this place called Parks where there's this radio telescope that was instrumental in bringing back the images from the moon landing. And there was an a anniversary celebration, a big festival, and I took my children and I wasn't looking for a book idea. Um, but at the festival, there were all of these, you know, exhibits. And one of the exhibits had this one little plaque that I can still picture that said, you know, something about the American Space Program and the rocket program out of Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, the German scientists who worked there, giant scientists, plural. And I thought to myself, how on earth did that happen? You know, 1950, World War II wasn't long finished. How did the scientists from Germany who were instrumental in developing the V2s, which did a lot of damage to London and Antwerp and other places, how did they end up in America? So I was driving, we were driving home quite late that night and, you know, the, the cell service in rural Australia is not great, but I'm on my phone trying to Google, trying to figure out, you know, I've never heard of the of the of, of Operation Paperclip or the rocket program in Huntsville. Um, and I'm reading all of these really positive articles about how this influx of German scientists some Nazi scientists from Germany came to America and it was all happy days and now Huntsville is, you know, 50 years later, this glorious multicultural paradise. Um, and I, I thought, I imagine it wasn't quite that simple. Um, and then I started researching and this story came into my head about these two women, one who had, you know, been through the Great Depression in Texas and uh her husband's working at Fort Bliss and then he comes over to Huntsville with a rocket program but her family's been impacted quite seriously by by what happened with the Nazis in Germany and then we've got this Nazi scientist and his wife who who were in Germany through the rise of the of the Nazis and then through the war and now they're in America in this world which surely was at least a little hostile towards them and so the story is about those two women and how they're meeting changes both of their lives. And I haven't actually done any talking about this book yet, so I'm very sorry if that took 15 or 20 minutes to explain. <laughs> it was great. No, it was no, great. It sounds so interesting. It sounds so good. And, and Kelly, I live in Alabama. I went to college in Alabama, and I have never, had never, until you wrote that book, had I ever heard about that. No way. See, no way. Like, I knew nothing the about that. About historical <laughs> fiction because, you know, I always know when I'm onto an idea that might be good to write about when I email my agent the proposal and she's in, she's in Manhattan, when she writes back and says, oh, I didn't know about this, you know, if yeah, it's American amazing. history, I always think, oh, well, if there's Americans who don't know about it as well, then this might be really interesting to write about. So it's that's good. Great. Cool. Right. I'll that's send you a great. copy. <laughs> so cool. Okay. It's amazing. I have a quick question for Sally. And it's it's uh, it's it resonates with me because I read a great quote from you about author self-doubt, which is such a part of my writing life. You said mm -hmm. self-doubt is part of every author's life. At best, self-doubt can push you to produce your best, most authentic work. At worst, it can stop you from producing anything at all. Making friends with self-doubt is an important part of becoming an author. Would you tell us a little bit about your journey with self-doubt and do not implicate Kelly in this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it's true, isn't it, that I, I've yet to meet a, a, a writer, at least a female writer, who does not talk about the doubt that they yeah. experience and yeah. uh, including writers who are very well published and very successful. In fact, maybe particularly uh, yeah. those people and yeah. I have had I mean my self-doubt has been consistent from first to, to current book yeah. um, yeah. books but I think that I really had a um, particular attack of self-doubt after my book between the mother-in-law and the good sister there was another book that didn't get published in there um, I spent a year writing a book and uh, it was funny time because I had had great success with the mother-in-law. That was option to Amy Poehler and I'd been on Good Morning America and, you know, things, I was getting lots of congratulations on my success, as it were. Uh, and, and then I wrote this other book and 
that book was turned down, you, you know, not just in one fell, you know, uh, thing, but it just became clear that it wasn't um, right and it wasn't working. And so that was, I mean, isn't that what we all have nightmares about? And yes. I'd spent, yeah, I'd spent so long on it. And so after that, I really had to kind of figure out how am I going to keep doing this with the fact that there's no guarantee that anything, you know, or that this won't happen again or that anything right. I ever write again will be any good. Right. Um, and so I did a couple of things, but the, the thing that I've continued to do since then has been write in 350 word bursts, oh, which yeah. I've since been diagnosed with ADHD, which is another thing. But if you're a writer with ADHD, writing in 350 word bursts is exactly in our wheelhouse for our short concentration span. Anyone can write 350 words. And there was something about kind of, and I would cross it off. I did six a day and I'd cross each one off. A, it allowed me to concentrate. B, it, it forced me to concentrate on just producing the words as opposed to really caring if they were any good or not. Um, and that removed that burden of, you know, am I ever going to get published again? Um, and it helped me get the words done. So um, that's what I still turn to. Wow, to awesome. kind of outrun the self-doubt because I kind of think at the end of each day, if I've written 2,000 words, it's been a successful day. And if it's a load of crap, which, you know, let's face it, it's probably going to be at some <laughs> point or another. And until I edit it, at least, it definitely is. Um, it allows me to keep, you know, making friends with the doubt and just still continuing to to produce the work because it's when you, your doubt stops you from doing it that it's a really... A problem, I think. Yeah, when it becomes paralyzing, it's definitely yeah. a problem. And that kind of segues yeah. us into, you know, we always like to ask about writing tips. So you've given us your Sally. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. true. Oh, yeah. Yes. Sally, Sally, it's Sally, Sally, Sally it's in sorry. Go sorry. Go ahead, Kristen. No, I was just going to say, there's, it's really interesting. I think it was Elizabeth Gilbert, but she <clears throat> wrote about fear. And she said, um, and fear in writing and creative work. And she said, you know, you can't get rid of it. So she compared it to taking a car trip and said, you're allowed to come, you know, and, and on the journey, you're just not allowed to drive. Mm. And it sounds like yeah. you're saying the same thing. Like you befriend mm -hmm. it. You say, I see you, you loathe self-doubt, you know, you're, yep. you're going to be here, but you don't get to drive the car. And I just love that. So. Yeah, exactly. It's... And it also, because you don't want to be publicly humiliated when people read your book, you can no. then take that self-doubt back and get it to be really critical as you edit. So yes. that's, you know, that's the friendship. Great. Oh, yeah. I love that. How about you, it. Kelly? Have you had to struggle to overcome self-doubt in your writing at all? Yeah. But, you know, I think there's, I think that's part of the magic of Sally, actually, is she's so resilient and she's vulnerable in, in being open about that. Because before I knew her, I assumed, you know, I mean, online, we all have it all together, don't we? <laughs> like everything's just easy online. If you look at your Instagram feed, yes. you're generally not yes. putting out there that there are days when you look at the page and think, oh my goodness, I've scammed everyone. How on earth did I get to this point? I don't know what I'm doing. But but when you've got friends like Sally, I mean, I can I can say that to Sally and she'll say, yes, I know, I'm the same. How did we get here? Oh, you know, we all feel like that. And, but you do it anyway, yeah. don't you? And for me, I write the first draft for me. It is just for me. No one's going to see it. I know I'm a good I editor. That. I still think I'm quite a poor writer, but I do it anyway because I know once I've got something on the page, I can massage it and work with it. I've got a great team as we all do. And so, you know, I, I know I'll get critical feedback from my editor and my agent and that's going to make the book good. So, you know, I've got to look forward to that as part of the process. So for me, the secret really has been, I think Jodie Picou said, you can't edit a blank page. And that is my whole career mantra. Just, just get something down for goodness sakes um, and go from there. Hmm. That's awesome. I so is your that. writing tip to be friends with me? Because yes, if it is, yes. I just hope you four ladies are listening to that. <laughs> We've taken it to heart. We've taken it to heart. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So Sally and Kelly, if you would not mind sticking around for a few more minutes, we have one additional question for you. But first, a few reminders from us. So just a quick reminder of our Writer's Block podcasts. I know we talk about it, but it is amazing. 
So the show is always a podcast every week, but also on Fridays, every single Friday, we have a writer's block podcast. This past week, Ron was joined by our very own Meg Walker when we were in Beaufort, North Carolina. And it is so much fun to listen to y'all. There are part of our community is on there. Meg talks about how we got started. And next week, Ron is talking to 30 Omnigar. I'm so scared I said that wrong. And I've met her and she's amazing. And it's for the book Honor. And that book was just chosen as Reese's book club pick. So we are thrilled that she will be on the podcast next week. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And also, I mean, how disappointed you would be to miss out on these. And one of our dearest friends from the show, Julia Kelly, her book that just came out yesterday that we all have a huge Mm -hmm. thumbs up. The Last Dance of the Debutante. We will have her on soon, too. So don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're hitting all those subscription buttons, don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter and our YouTube channel so that you never miss a thing. I mean, Mm -hmm. if you weren't getting our newsletter, you wouldn't know that Sally's Perfect Day includes reading in bed during a thunderstorm with alcohol. And Holly's pandemic vice was watching 30 Rock reruns. You would be crushed not to know these things. So make sure that you subscribe and you can find back episodes on Loco Plus, a new streaming platform, which also includes loads of other brand new content from other independent creators. And if you're not hanging out with us yet in the Friends and Fiction official book club, you're missing out. The group, which is separate from us and is run by our friends, Lisa, Lisa Harrison and Brenda Gardner, is now more than 10,000 strong. Join them on January 24th when our friend Wade Rouse, who writes as Viola Shipman, will be joining them for an in-depth chat about the secret of snow. And make sure to join us for our next episode of Friends in Fiction next Wednesday, right here at 7 p.m., where we will welcome Jeffrey Deaver. Then on January 19th, we'll host Jillian Cantor, the author of Beautiful Little Fools, and Jenny Judson and Danielle Mafood, the authors of The Last Season. If you're ever wondering about our schedule, it's always on our Friends in Fiction website and on the header graphic on our Facebook page. All right, Sally and Kelly, you're up one more time. One question we always like to ask before our guests leave is what were the values around reading and writing when you were growing up? So the values around reading and writing in your childhood homes. Kelly, do you want to start? Yes. um, I I didn't grow up in a big book house, I'll be honest, but I discovered the power of sinking into a book and disappearing into another world quite young Mm -hmm. and was that classic nerdy bookworm child who was always facing a book. And once I kind of figured out that I could write as well, um, I was just a weird writing and reading kid, do you know what I mean? And my family just left a lot of space for me to be as gloriously weird as I was. And um, (laughs) and it just, it just, it wasn't that they, I don't think that they ever got it, but they were so respectful of it because I was passionate about it. That's awesome. How about you, Sally? Uh, I did have, uh, I did grow up in a big book household. My mum was a teacher. Uh, my dad was also a reader and uh, and one thing that I think about a lot that I have taken from my childhood into my now family of choice and with my children is that uh, I remember when I was growing up and you know we didn't always have a lot of money we always had everything we needed but not necessarily um, a lot more and there were times when we knew never to ask mum for things when we were out, you know, treats or or anything like that. But if we ever asked for a book in a bookstore, we always got it. And uh, we knew that you could ask for a book even when times were tough and and mum would would buy it, even though you could get it at the library. Um, And we we were big library goers. But um, as an adult, she's told us that that was about instilling the value of books in us and that that was something that we were prepared to spend money on even when when money was tight. And uh, and, you know, my kids now know that if they are out with us or, or with Gran as well, then um, they're always going to come home with books. And, and I always tell that to people who want to make their children 
love reading um, because it, it definitely worked for me. Oh, I love that. What a great piece of advice. Well, ladies, this was such a pleasure to have you tonight. We have so, so many questions. Oh, we loved it so much. Um, you know, we, we, we had such a great conversation that we didn't get to ask viewer questions like we often do. So if you have a chance, there are a lot of questions um, in the comments on the Facebook feed. If you have a chance to go back and answer some of them. I mean, we had hundreds of yeah. people watching tonight hundreds of questions um it, it was just such a pleasure you guys to, are to amazing kick, to kick oh, the year off with the all the pleasure was ours much. believe me honestly thank you <laughs> awesome. well we can't wait to come visit you in australia and we're so excited for your <laughs> it's so fun i know we're planning the trip as soon as we end the show tonight. and if y'all would like to come here <laughs> yes oh the tour of we're the on our way i mean as <laughs> soon as we hang up <laughs> Throw another We're shrimp on, on the barbie. Line. We'll be there soon. <laughs> exactly. Oh, this is going to work out. This, just give me your your home addresses in the chat. And, uh, <laughs> we'll see soon. Now it's awful. Now it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make it weird, Sally. <laughs> <laughs> At least we made it to the end. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, Sally, and awesome. Sally and Kelly, thank you so much. That's we are so, so excited for your releases, and we'll see you again soon. Bye bye. Can you have a Diane nice. for us? Well, I you can't believe you've got Diane on next. Oh, yes. What? Say hi to That's Diane. Cool. Look around if you want. Diane. Don't look around if you want. You You're welcome yeah. to stay. See Diane. You can. All right. Well, everybody you know, out there. It's only 11 a.m. there, so your excuses are. You can Smart. ask for her address <laughs> too and make it even weirder. So make oh, sure, yeah. make sure everyone out there to stay for our after show where we will welcome Diane Chamberlain. And don't forget that you can find all of our back episodes on YouTube. We are live there every week, just like we are on Facebook. And if you subscribe, you won't miss a thing. Plus, you'll have access to special short clips. Be sure to come back next week, same time, same place, as we welcome Jeffrey Deaver. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you for tuning in. You can join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Also, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Well, we've scared Sally off, but Kelly's still with us. Yes. So. Right. 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 That's real chat. That's, that's pretty Kelly good for us. Friends. Yeah, yeah, I mean, best friends. Yeah, I know. You, well, it's official now. She's going to kick herself. This is glorious. Obviously, <laughs> won the competition, Kelly. <laughs> this was our final test, and you've passed. <laughs> I thought if I stayed here, I'd be able to see Diane. That's the only reason I stayed at the computer because I'm a mega, mega fan of hers and have been obsessed with her for such a long so time. Awesome. She blurred one of my books once and I cried when I got the email. Oh, <laughs> oh. awesome. And well, she, she has a, a wonderful person. She's, oh, she's just amazing. She's amazing. amazing. Hopefully she'll be popping on in just a minute. She hasn't signed on yet. Um, I assume that Sally probably scared her away. Do you think? Yeah. Oh, that, it was the address that. thing. Yeah, that yeah. Thing. <laughs> Diane was like, those women are terrifying. I can't come. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Diane. Hi, guys. Welcome. welcome to the show. You popped on at exactly the right time. Oh, my gosh. Thank God you're here. <laughs> <laughs> all right well, everybody. Everyone, oh, that was a fabulous hour oh, oh thank you so thank much you. didn't we have so much fun our kelly that and sally so just great oh. fantastic well everybody out there welcome back for our first after show of the year um and kelly i think is going to stick around and hang out with us for a few minutes is that right kelly I am, yeah. You can just kick me off when I get to be too much. I just, I just wanted to stop and say hi to Diane. Hello, Diane. How are you? Oh, 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 I scared her away. Look, you kicked her, her out. out. Molly, I'm I'm so so Maybe I should go. <laughs> well, I you know what? I, I assume she's coming back. But you know, while we're waiting for her, maybe we can talk a little bit about her. We thought we would start the year off with a bang by bringing in our friend Diane Chamberlain, whose latest novel, The Last House on the Street, is coming out in just six days. Mary Kay, do you want to tell us a little bit about her? 
I do because she's such a special dear friend. Diane is a New York Times, USA Today, and Sunday Times bestselling author of nearly 30 novels, including last year's Big Lies in a Small Town, The Stolen Marriage, and The Secret Life of Cece Wilkes. She lives in North Carolina with her significant other, partner John Paliuka, and their Shetland sheepdog, Cole. And I will say that Diane and I were part of an amazing writers group while I lived in Raleigh. And I can tell you that Diane, as a former hospital social worker, she's just an invaluable aid to any writer struggling with character motivation. Sean, can we get Diane back on? Oh, oh she's Sally. Sally came back. Sally. I can't believe I went off. Hi, Diane. <laughs> oh, hi. I thought you were I, leaving. I, I, I hung up. I did the wrong thing. And then I saw Kelly up here making friends with you. And I just quickly scrambled to get back. I'm so glad you're both here. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to sit here and mute. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Sally, you. you know what's That's been it. cracking me up, Sally, is your your one star reviews that you read. <laughs> yes. I mean, that They're takes so courage. <laughs> we should start a thing where we all read our one star reviews. We, we should. We should. We should. Oh, that would be video. fun. We Kelly is shaking. I love now. that idea. Hey, my soul could not take it. I can't look at my reviews. I am not as resilient as Sally. I would just be in a heap. But they're so funny. You just read the funny ones. Yeah. I love you know, the, the ones that, that you know, I you read 1% of this and book. Stuff. And yes. One star. Christy, Christy, you had a good one about how it, the book didn't clean the person's carpet or something, didn't you? Yeah, it did <laughs> not. It did not adhere to their rug the way that they... I was like... <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah. All right, en <laughs> enough of the silliness, although we love silliness. <laughs> Diane, I, I just wish I could kiss the screen. It's so good to see you. Yeah, you too, Kathy. Miss you. All right. I know. I miss you too. Tell I mean, Mary little... Kay. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about The Last House on the Street, which comes out next week. And I really, I'm so interested in how your interest in the civil rights movement, um, which is a big part of this book was sparked when you were only 14 and it kind of carries back to last year's book too doesn't it what was last year's book i don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a little bit of a different era i feel like when sally was saying you know she doesn't know how to talk about the new book and it's really it's hard in the beginning yes. isn't it yeah it's just okay, like, but it's a, it's a dual timeline book i can tell you that yes it is a dual timeline book okay now and go I think what you're referring to is um, when I was 14, Right. I awakened to the news as I did every morning, and they were talking about three young civil rights workers in Alabama or Mississippi who had been murdered, brutally murdered. And they were two um, white guys and a black guy, and they were students, they were college students. And that struck me because, A, I was a student, and B, I was in schools that were half black. And so it, it opened my eyes to um, civil rights work and to the fact that a student could do something, that a student had some power. And so uh, The Last House on the Street, it is that dual timeline. And it's about um, a young woman in 1965, she's 20, and she joins um, the effort. She's a North Carolinian. She joins the effort of uh, a group of students who try to um, register black voters in the South. And all of the other workers are from the North so she has kind of this double whammy to, to deal with. She has to win over not only the black voters, but also these Northern students. Nobody really trusts her or trusts her motivation. And of course she has very private motivation for why she's doing this. And then the second story 
the second timeline is 2010. And it's a young woman named Kayla who is about to move into a beautiful new home that she and her husband built. And her husband has just died. And so she's moving in with her little girl and she's very depressed and very sad about moving into this house. And the house is on the same street that our first character's house was on. You know, very old house and then this brand new sparkling house. And it's, it's not clear to the reader, I do not think, how these stories tie together. Um, and I love doing that. It's really fun for me as a writer to write two kind of completely different storylines and then see the twists and turns that bring those two stories together. So that's, that's it in a nutshell, but the nutshell is pretty big. I cannot wait to read this book. I cannot it's wait. so good. I got to read an it. early copy. I was so lucky. And it, I, I've been a long time Diane Chamberlain fan. And up until this book, Necessary Lies, was my favourite. And I was just uh, telling everyone. And then now this one is just your best and your, your brilliant. I can't talk anymore, but I just loved it so much. Thank Sorry, you I wasn't so going to say anything. It means a lot coming from you. It really does. <laughs> so good. Sally, you well, can say whatever you want, except for asking for addresses or phone yeah, numbers. You can say that was crossing the line. Diane lives on the you last can... house on the street. I'm just going to tell you. You can have my address and my phone number, Sally. Oh, good. <laughs> Let's talk offline. <laughs> Kelly, I really loved the way you described researching oh, and especially you. going down the rabbit hole, you know, just yeah. discovering little tidbits that feed your creativity. Mm -hmm. um, of course, that's exactly what I do as well. And it's just, uh, it changes your story, doesn't it? You've got it an idea that you're going to go in one direction and then a little bit of research comes along and suddenly you're uh, in a whole different place. And it's usually a better place. Yeah. Yeah. That's so well put. Wow. Um, well, Publishers Weekly gave the, your new book, a starred review saying Chamberlain delivers the goods with this affecting and spellbinding account of community's buried secrets. The dual narratives merge beautifully before an explosive conclusion. This will keep readers enthralled. So I have a book, The Wedding Veil, uh, coming out in March that also tackles two time periods, one in the past and one in the present, sort of similar to your book. Uh, not a similar book, but similar timeline situation. So can you talk a bit about the challenges of writing a dual timeline book like this mm -hmm. one and why the payoff can be so rich? Mm. Um, one of the hardest things is keeping the voices separate. Yeah. And what yeah. I do is I pretty much know the story, although it changes constantly. Um, I know where I'm going. And I will write one entire storyline first and then write the whole second storyline. And then oh, yeah. I'm often terrified to see how they fit together because it's all these different chapters and I know I want to alternate chapters most of the time. And how are they going to fit together? And usually it's kind of a little miracle. Usually they do fit together pretty well. Um, occasionally I have to juggle some things, but the other, the good, one of the best reasons for doing it that way for me is not losing that voice because when you're writing, it's yeah. so easy to have yeah. the other character start sounding like the first character, vice versa. Yeah. So I find it really helpful to kind of stick with one timeline and one character and then mush them together and see what happens. It's exciting. Yeah. I wish That's we'd had this conversation no like part. 18 months ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did I, you do it, Christy? <laughs> not that way. And that would have been really smart. And actually, I'm at, I'd forgotten about this. And, and it sort of makes my stomach hurt to think about it now. But I wrote the whole book and then realized that the way I had alternated the chapters, I really didn't like. So I separated the whole historical part from the whole contemporary part and then redid it. And it really, yeah. it was, it was bad. Now, Diane, <laughs> are you still storyboarding? Um, I did not storyboard on this book. 
And I don't think I storyboarded on um, Big Lies in a Small Town either. I think I, I'm changing without yeah. your input. I just <laughs> no, you know, I have a storyline. You know, we I, I'll tell you guys, we used to do these great writers retreats twice a year um, to a um, to a retreat, uh, fabulous the the Weymouth um, in North Carolina in. Um, Southern Pines and, and a group of us would go and um, I would every year I would try to storyboard and I couldn't do it. But Diane was a, used to be a whiz at it. Yeah, I love to doing it. But I, something has changed. Um, mm. I don't I had to know exactly where my story was going. And right. these days I don't seem to know that. Actually, right now I wish that I did know where the next mm. one is going. I never know. <laughs> Yeah, it's well, it's surprising, you know. And we should, also, it's you know, this is my 28th book, the one that just came out. And it's wow. um, you change, you, your yes, process you changes, yep. you do, you grow for better or worse. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's a real different process than I used to have. And it's terrifying. Who was talking about being terrified? Sally, I know we're all terrified, but oh, we're yes. all. <laughs> But I'm particularly yeah. terrified, yeah. <laughs> Whenever you're starting a new book and until yeah. it's done and sometimes even after it's done, there yes. is this sheer terror of, can I do this yeah. again? Yeah. Uh, so or did I, I even do it right do this, this time? Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Oh, no, this one is the one that's going to ruin my career. Yeah. Every time. Yes. Every but, you know, time. Diane, this one didn't ruin your career. In fact, in fact, um. Last House on the Street is this week's People Magazine yeah. Book of the Week. Sean, do we have that graphic? Where's Sean? Did Sean check out? No, nope. uh, I hope not. Because if Sean's gone, so are we. We're talking to ourselves. <laughs> there it is. Look at that. It's the Book of the Week. The Last that House is, on the Street. I have to say that's really pretty. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Cheers I'm very, very excited about that. Oh, that's great. That's Kelly, awesome. did you did you have a quick question you wanted to ask? Yeah, Diane? Diane, I could ask you a thousand questions, but they won't let me because we'll run out of time and I've only got one. So I wanted to talk to you about Cole. Now, I love following you on social media because I'm a crazy dog lady and I love your dog. He's so beautiful. But can you, I've noticed <laughs> that it seems like riders and dogs, you know, there's a, that stereotype about cats and riders, but I feel like us dog riders are the best ones. And can you just yeah. tell us about your life with Cole and, and is he, oh, he's obviously an important part of your family. He is. He's a very odd little dog. He's a Shetland sheep dog <laughs> and he is very bonded to John and myself, but he is not at all interested in anybody else. And he's afraid of everybody else. He's almost 10. I took him to, um, all kinds of dog classes, including fearful Fido class. And the oh first night he, he hid under my chair. And the last night he hid under my chair. Oh, Money so, well spent. I know. <laughs> we have a guitar Fido circle. like a book title. Our fearful guitar Fido. circle meets here. Um, and it's about 16 people. And we all sit around in a circle. And he just parks himself right under my chair and watches everybody from there. And they all try, you know, they try with treats, they try all different ways, and he's just not having it. But he <laughs> is the easiest dog I've ever owned. I mean, he's so obedient and good. He's just a good boy. Thanks for asking oh, about him. Oh, that was beautiful. <laughs> Well, what a night, ladies. So this was so much fun. And uh, Diane, we're so excited about your book coming out in six Thank days. Thank you. And thanks for having me back. Oh, we're thrilled. And Diane, I'm so glad I, I got to love you, Diane. Because I, I was I gone the last time. It was the only episode I missed last year. Was your oh, episode. wow. So I remember. I'm happy, I'm happy we're finally getting to see each other. Thanks. It's so good to see you guys and to get to talk with uh, Kelly and Sally. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, well, I want to know what, where these writing retreats are happening and if Kelly and I are invited to come to the next one. <laughs> I was actually just thinking that how be fun so that would fun. be. We should all go to Weymouth. I just did an event there and um, and it was so fun. And I was thinking that. I was like, we need to do this. Yeah, and yeah. there are ghosts. There where are in? Ghosts there. Or come to Australia. <gasps> Excellent. That would be even funner. <laughs> Boy, Sally, can you Sally imagine traveling? 
It seems yeah. like a long way off. Oh, I know. Sit next to Mary Kay on the plane. It'll be a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to need a lot of Chardonnay. <laughs> I'll get the booze yeah. and I'll find the venue. You know, I live in wine country. country. Just fun. come to me. We've got vineyards everywhere. Just That's come to true, my house. actually. Yep. Okay. There you go. Fine. That sounds we amazing. could at least do it virtually. <laughs> you guys are going to freak out when we take you seriously. Yeah. I know. When we show oh, up no, on your doorstep, you're going to regret all of this. <laughs> we would all love right. it. Well, thank you all so much for joining oh, us. Awesome. I hope everyone out there will buy Julia Kelly's The Last Dance of the Debutante this week. Diane's The Last House on the Street next week. Yeah. And of course, Sally's new book and Kelly's new book later this year. And in the meantime, catch up on The Good Sister and The Warsaw Orphan. They're absolutely amazing. Ladies, I cannot think of a better way to have started off 2022. This Thank was you so all. great. Thank you for having so us. Bye, everybody. Bye, Diane. 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 Bye,